so we all know who we are with today and we can address you accordingly if you have any questions. To avoid the disruption of the program, all mics will be muted when the program starts. Mics will be enabled if you are called during the Q&A or you may type your question on the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, feel free to use the, zo the Zoom chat box to ask questions or share your comments. Uh, today's session will be recorded uh, and you may use it as part of our platforms and publications. And thank you so much. I'd like to turn over to our executive director, Coco Alquas. Thank you, Bettina. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Coco Alquas, executive director at Makati Business Club. On behalf of MBC, I'd like to thank everyone here for joining us today. This is the third installment of our MBC Economic Briefing Series. The series aims to help leaders from various sectors be informed about the latest political economy issues. We'd like to thank Mon Denis and our sponsor for making this event possible. Sadly, it's a relevant day to be talking about agriculture today. Just this morning, the government announced that inflation climbed again in January to 8.7%, the highest since 2008. And we all know why. Our topic today, food. Food inflation in January was 11.2%. Do you know what it was in January last year? 11.2 this January, 1.6% last January. That's in large part because agri has been growing so poorly over decades. That means low incomes for the poorest Filipinos and expensive food for all Filipinos. We decided to talk about agri because we want to contribute to the understanding of the problem and possible solutions in the sector. We hope this helps nudge public and private sector players to take the steps needed to boost production and farm incomes and create abundant, affordable food supply. Expect to hear more from MBC on this in the coming months. For now, I'm gonna turn back to Bettina for a quick overview before she introduces our speaker, Dr. Adriano. Bettina. Thanks, Coco. Um, so I'll just give a quick overview that's also informed uh, by the expertise of Dr. Adriano uh, on the Philippine agriculture sector. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, to, as mentioned today, we'll be discussing uh, the you know, turning around Philippine agriculture sector. Next slide, please. Um, so let's look at the main problem. Uh, as Coco mentioned, uh, did not not just with the inflation stats today but also with the previous you know the stats released over the years the main problem in agriculture is the underdevelopment and underperformance of the sector um in the fourth quarter of 2022 the agriculture sector actually contracted uh, by 0.3 percent and for the year of 2022 the growth rate was only at 0.5 percent which is in stark contrast to our services sector and other uh, key sectors Next slide, please. Um, okay. So, um, as Coco mentioned, and as Dr. Adriano has informed of us as well, um, agricultural growth has been very, very slow. Um, from 2001 to 2022, it grew at an average of 2.4%. And if you look at the chart here, um, that's in stark contrast to services and industrial production. Um, and that's considering that, you know, we are considered as um, supposedly a resource-rich country. Next slide, please. Um, and if you look at employment, um, I guess it's the reason why a lot of this is being connected to the idea of poverty. Because despite the sector being very laggard, there are still a lot of Filipinos working in the agriculture sector. It's still a major contributor to overall employment, as you can see here, it's even higher than industry. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, compared to our ASEAN neighbors, the Philippines has been very much lagging behind. Uh, as you can see in this chart, uh, we are actually the lowest in terms of exports uh, compared to what is considered our competitors within the ASEAN region or economies that are considered quite similar to the Philippines. Um, and up until 2020 and up until now, we're still uh, very much lagging behind in terms of uh, agricultural exports. And as you know, the Philippines is a net importer of a lot of key food commodities. Next slide, please. 
Um, and, and as mentioned, since a lot of uh, Filipinos are involved um, or are working within the agriculture sector, the underdeveloped and underperformance has led to low wages and high poverty incidents. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the the level of poverty within agricultural households it's four times higher than the regular non agricultural households. Next slide, please. Um, and as uh, Coco mentioned, and as Dr. Adrian has informed us, the main contributor to inflation is food inflation. Uh, between the period of 2000 to 2021, it's still a major contributor to the country's headline inflation. All the more now, especially with the, you would say, shocking statistics that was released this morning um, on the inflation rate. Um, as you can see, food and non-alcoholic uh, commodities comprise 43% contributing to inflation. Next slide, please. Um, which has you know, led to malnutrition. As you can see, uh, we have uh, the high domestic food prices has in turn um, taken an effect on the poor. And the Philippines has one of the highest malnutrition rates versus its ASEAN neighbors. Next slide, please. And I think uh, our speaker uh, will discuss today what actually causes the underdeveloped but the underperformance of agriculture. He will also be discussing his recommendations on how the government can actually act upon this and uh, improve our agricultural sector. So uh, just to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Carlo Fermin Adriano, he is an advisor to the Department of Agriculture and is a published scholar and advocate of diversified farming systems and value chains. Dr. Adriano will be discussing the current state challenges and ways forward to help the Philippines' undeveloped agriculture industry to grow and become more competitive. Uh, later on after this, he will be joined by our panelist, Mr. J.T. Solis, um, whom I will introduce later. And with that, I'd like to call on our keynote speaker, Dr. Carlo Fermin Adriano. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bettina. Thank you, Coco. Uh, it's a it's a honor to to present here in uh, this forum. So the title of my presentation is "What Ails Philippine Agriculture: Direction for Future Reforms." So Bettina already mentioned the problem of agriculture sector is the underdevelopment and its underperformance. Now, because of the underdevelopment she mentioned three major effects, negative effects. One is low wages and high poverty incidence of agriculture households. Two, soaring domestic food prices. Uh, just take note, last year, December, December 2022, almost 50% of our headline inflation is coming from food. So that means last December, it was 8.1%. So around 4% of our inflation is coming from food inflation. And the number three effect is high malnutrition rates because of the soaring domestic food prices. So what I will be presenting will be the causes of the problem and their recommendations. So I identified five major causes of the problem. One is the self-sufficiency and commodity-based policy. Two, permanent protectionist policy. This is with international trade. Three, rice-centric budget. Number four, limited economies of scale due to land fragmentation, and number five, the DA institutions. All right, let's start with number one, self-sufficiency and commodity-based policy. Now, in pursuit of self-sufficiency, spending was focused on increasing primary production of cereals, mainly rice, basically, through provision of input subsidies. And those input subsidies are fertilizer, seeds, etc. This has detracted attention to other more important goals, such as higher agricultural growth, greater competitiveness, poverty reduction, and sustainability. Now, the figure on your right just shows you that around 40% of our budget, of the DA budget, goes to input subsidies. Now, the figure on your right shows you these are the average budget allocation of the banner program. So, DA has banner programs or commodity programs, rice, corn, etc. And around 61% of the banner program spending is for input subsidies. Now, one thing to take note is that 
past DA administration considered self-sufficiency to be synonymous to food security. Now that is very wrong. Food security is not equal to national production or self-sufficiency of agriculture commodities. Food security is about equal to equal accessibility, availability, and affordability to safe and nutritious food. Just take note of Singapore, which ranks second as the most, most food secure in Asia, where in fact, it doesn't produce much agriculture goods. Now, again, unfortunately, world experience had shown that input subsidies as the major policy instrument are inefficient and ineffective in raising productivity and competitiveness of the agriculture sector based from World Bank study. Now, why? Because input subsidy only has a temporary effect, meaning as long as the fertilizer program is there, as long as the seed program is there, they will have productivity gains. But once it stops, there's no more productivity gains. Number two, input subsidies are found to be one size fit all subsidies. It's not optimal to all types of farmer, farmlands or farm size. Just an example, fertilizer. So the fertilizer to be given to farmers should be dependent on the nutrient needed by the soil. But when you provide input subsidies, fertilizer subsidy, it's basically one size fits all. It's like a civil bullet. Number three, it has regressive benefits meaning larger farmers benefit more. An example, like the hybrid seeds, wherein you need to have techno technical knowledge and some sort of capital to be able to fully capture the potential productivity of the hybrid seeds. And only large farmers can basically capture the potential productivity gains of those hybrid seeds. And number four, it crowds out private investment in the upstream. Now, an example of this self-sufficiency through input subsidy, because of this policy, basically, there is weak value chain approach in the agriculture sector. The focus, again, was on primary production, and there was inadequate attention given to the other segments of the agriculture value chain, the upstream, midstream, secondary production, and downstream as demonstrated by the relatively low forward linkages improvement in the sector. Now, this figure shows you the forward linkage percentage change from 1994 to 2012. Just take a look at the left, which is the forward linkage percentage change of the AFF, the agriculture sector. It's only 10%. Now, what is forward linkage? How much of the output of the agriculture sector is being used as an input by the other sectors, mainly food manufacturing. So it only improved by 10% in like almost 20 years. Another example of this weak value chain approach is as shown by the underdevelopment of critical value chain infrastructure, such as logistics, warehouse, and cold chain. The figure on your left shows you the logistic cost over sales ratio. And as you can see here, Philippines has one of the highest. It's uh, two times greater than Vietnam and three times greater than Thailand. Now, the figure on your right shows you the refrigerated warehouse capacity for urban resident. And as you can see here, pH is only 1.3. Vietnam is 4.1. So Vietnam has four times more warehouse refrigerated warehouse capacity. This is basically your cold chain. Now, Another effect of this self-sufficiency policy is there is inadequate expenditure on public goods because all of your budget is going to input subsidies. You don't have much budget for public goods. Again, the focus on pub public AFF spending was on the provision of input subsidies. World experience shows that funding more agriculture, public goods, for instance, research and development, yield lasting immense benefits by increasing productivity and raising incomes of farmers at very modest costs. So if you take a look at the right, these are the advantages of public goods. What are public goods? Example is research and development. Another example is your climate change. So because public goods have long-term effects, sector-wide benefit does not crowd out private investment and it's cost effective. Now, another example of inadequate expenditure of public goods. Now, this graph shows you the budget of AMIA, which is the Adaptation and Mitigation Initiative in Agriculture. 
which is basically the institution in the DA for the climate uh, responsible for the climate resiliency of the AFF. And as you can see here for 2023, its budget is only 207 million pesos. Now, if you take a look later, I will show you the budget of the RICE program, RICE banner program. It's 30 billion. So we have 30 billion for the RICE banner program. But for climate resiliency, we only have 200 million pesos for 2023. Another example of this inadequate expenditure on public goods, yeah. research and development. In agriculture has been under budget. Now, this figure shows you the research intensity in agriculture of selected countries. And as you can see here, if you compare us to Malaysia and Thailand, we're far behind. Number two, cause of the problem is the permanent protectionist policy. There is little incentive for agri-producers to be productive and the sector to innovate as foreign competition was held at bay through high tariff protection and non-tariff barriers. Now, these are just examples of the tariff rates for some key agriculture commodities. And as you can see here, pork still as high as 40%, chicken still as high as 40%, fish there is no tariff for fish, fish, but there is an import quantitative restriction, meaning you cannot import when the government says that you cannot import. So you need permission for, from the government to import fish. You have rice before. There is also an import quantitative restriction through the NFA, but now it has been liberalized because of the RTL. Corn, as high as 50%. And again, you have sugar as high as 65%. And again, as you all know, there is import quantitative restriction for sugar, meaning you cannot import when the government tells you you cannot import. Now, food and nutrition security has been a glaring issue in the country given local supply shortages and restricted trade of key agricultural commodities. If you take a look at this table, just take a look at the supply deficit and surplus. And as you can see there, it's all red, meaning we have local supply shortages. For corn, we're only 48% sufficient, sufficiency, sufficient. Fish, 66%. Pork, 78%. Rice, 92%. Chicken, 80%. Refined sugar, 73%. Now, the next cause of the problem is, again, the rice-centric budget. So on average, 50% or 11 billion of the DA's banner program budget goes to the rice sector from 2017 to 2022. Now, in 2023, the budget share of the rice banner program will significantly increase to a whopping 70% or a total of 30 billion pesos. Now, this will lead to the further neglect of the non-rice agriculture commodities. All right. So again, biggest pie here, the, the blue pie, it's the rice. So for 2023, 70% of the DA banner program will go to rice. So there, there's not much money for the other agriculture commodities. Now, the rice sector will approximately get 85 billion pesos in 20... Hello? What happened to the slides? Uh, the slides was switched. Oh, yeah. And there. So rice sector will approximately get 85 billion pesos in 2023. This is equivalent to a 45 increase from 2022 and around 52% of your total budget of the whole agriculture sector in 2023. So more than 50% of the budget of the whole agriculture sector will go to rice in 2023. Now, what's the problem with that? Unfortunately, DA's budget is not based on the contribution of the subsector to the economy, which is measured by the, its cross value added. Now, animal production, as you can see here on the figure on your left, has the highest share to the gross value added at 26%. Second lang on your rise at 21%. Now, given a 26% share to GVA of the animal production, its budget share is only 12%. As you can see on the figure on your right, 
here on the right, the blue bar shows you the budget share of the commodity, and the green bar shows you the GVA share of that commodity. For, in for instance, rice budget share is 70% when its GVA share is only 21%, so it's over budgeted. Now take a look at high value crops. Its share to GVA is 19%, but its budget share is only 5%. Now, also, the DA's budget is not based on commodities where the country has comparative advantage and the country's agri-food export. When we say comparative advantage, when we say that the Philippines has a comparative advantage, for instance, to coconut, it means that we are relatively more efficient producers of coconut compared to other countries. So here, as you can see here, so you have a from 0 to 2.4 here. Now we have a comparative advantage if it's less than 1. All right? And as you can see here, rice is 2. So we don't have comparative advantage on rice, but we put all of our money on rice. Now due to the lack of support of goods with comparative advantage, Dr. Clarete actually estimated that the Philippines is losing agri-food export earnings by around $230 million in 2018. Now also, the ACE budget is not based on poverty incidents. Rice farmers are relatively well off compared to other agriculture commodities, and yet rice gets the lion's share in terms of budget. This figures just shows you the poverty incidence by agriculture commodity in 2018. And as you can see there, poverty incidence of palai, growing palai, is only 19%. Highest poverty incidence is, are found in corn, coconut. Now, the fourth cause of the problem is the limited economies of scale. The average farm size is only around one hectare in 2012, which impedes economies of scale. It includes the use of technology and also restricts in private investments and the efficient transfer of government programs. As you can see here from 1960, the average farm size was around 3.6 hectare, and then 1980s, 2.84 hectares, and then CARP was implemented around 1987, and until now, basically, as you can see here, average farm size is going smaller, smaller, and smaller. Number five, cause of the problem is the DA institutions per se. Uh, the DA institutions typically are biased towards more regulation than development. Why? Because there is a tendency for them to pursue more rent-seeking activities in regulation where money is involved compared to performing developmental functions. So again, basically the focus mostly of the DA institution is more on regulation rather than developing the sector. Now, another problem in the DA institution, it's its low absorptive capacity, or strong spelling, low absorptive capacity. Now, DA's budget significantly increased in 2023. It's around 102 billion. The average budget of the DA was only $64 billion from 2016 to 2022, so it's a 59% increase. Now, why it has been why the DA's agriculture DA's uh, budget has been small historically? It's because of its low absorptive capacity. The historically low share of the budget of the DA to the total budget of the government is due to its low disbursement rate. Now, what is this disbursement rate? Basically, how much of the budget given to you is being used? So as you can see here, on average from 2010 to 2021, average disbursement rate of DA is only 65%. Compare that to the other institutions, it's 82%. That's why, why are you going to give more money to DA when you know when you know historically it has a low disbursement rate? So you have to fix the low absorptive capacity first before you actually give it more and more money. Now, given these problems, I will switch, I will discuss my recommendations. So I divided my recommendations to urgent and midterm. So urgent for this year, midterm, from uh, that should be 2023 to 2028. 
So what are the urgent? So urgent recommendations to address food inflation and malnutrition given our high food inflation. Number one, the temporary reduction of tariff rates and increase of minimum access volume on key agricultural commodities and easing of import quantitative restriction like in fish and sugar. Basically, the high prices of agriculture commodities here in the Philippines is because of lacking of supply, insufficient supply. We really need to import in the short term if we want to control food inflation. It already happened to sugar and it already happened to onion. As you can see, if you take a look at the data of PSA for, for vegetables, vegetables um, inflation in December was already 25%. All right. Fish is also around 20%. So we really need to import because there is insufficiency of supply of key agriculture commodities. So this temporary reduction can be done through an EO executive order. Number two, is we have to strengthen our ASEAN trade relations to ensure rice availability and affordability and ratification of the RCEP. Now, why do we need ensure rice availability and affordability because we are basically a rice country when prices are incre when rice prices are increasing there's already a panic compared to other commodities like onion even if the onion is soaring prices of onion already soaring there's not much panic compared to rice number 3 we have to remove the psychosanitary sps as non tariff barriers on agriculture commodities. A prime example of this is onion. So why can't we import onion? It's because they're not approving the SPS. So they're using SPS as a non-tariff barrier, and that's actually illegal. And five, there needs to be a provision of unconditional cash assistance to subsistence farmers as identified in the RSPSA. They're really affected by the high food, food prices. And we, if we don't assist them or help them, there will be repercussions to their malnutrition and their productivity. Lastly, recommendations for the midterm from 2023 to 2028 to address the development of the agriculture sector. Number one, we need the institutional reform. So this is legislative. We have to separate excuse me, the developmental and regulatory offices in the DA to avoid conflict of interest. Number two, there needs to be a capacitation of central development offices and the capacitation of LGUs in the delivery of AFF services. And we have to increase absorptive capacity. Basically, we need more developmental people in the DA. Number two, there needs to be a paradigm shift from commodity-driven and self-sufficiency policy to a holistic agri-food system approach in attaining food and nutrition security. Basically, our, our paradigm should not be self-sufficiency. Our paradigm should be on food and nutrition security, and this can be done by taking a holistic agri-food system value chain approach. Number three, there needs to be diversification of, of DA spending, basically from rice to other agriculture commodities because all of our budget is going to rice. And we have to promote crop diversification. And this crop diversification plan should be region or province-based, region or province-specific based on the comparative advantage of that region or province. Number four, we have to amend the comprehensive agrarian reform law. So maybe increase the five hectare limit to 25 to 30 and intensify farm consolidation and promote what we call agri-business venture agreements. And number five, we have to increase expenditure on public goods such as research and development and market support. Which we have, which we know have long-lasting effects, versus input subsidies, which will, which have only temporary effects. So again, more on public goods than input subsidies. And lastly, there needs to be a gradual opening of agriculture commodities to foreign competition 
to promote innovation among local producers. So we shift from perpetual protection to one that is time-bound. And we can follow the rice tarification style wherein all of the tariff collection from the importation of agriculture commodities will be plowed back to the agriculture sector. That ends my presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Adriana, for that very, very informative presentation. Before we proceed to the Q&A, I would like to turn over to our panelist, Mr. JT Solis. So JT is the CEO of Miami. Miami is an agri-fishery startup and that provides sustainable market linkage to small so small stake far, um, smallholder farmers and fisher folk in the Philippines. Currently, Mayani directly sources harvests from grassroots from a grassroots network of over 139,000 smallholder farmers across five regions in Luzon. Mayani recently secured 1.7 million dollars in seed funding anchored by Silicon Valley Agritech VC Ag Funder through its Grow Impact Fund. And with that, I'd like to turn over to JT to share his reactions and insights. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Bettina, for, for that very generous introduction. I'd like to greet everybody. Uh, wonderful afternoon uh, today, especially the organizers, Makati Business Club, uh, Professor Adriano, for giving that very incisive, very insightful, and very comprehensive situation for the Philippines, as well as the corresponding uh, recommendations. Um, perhaps from my end, I'll be sort of speaking from a from a technopreneur standpoint and more from a I would say from a startup uh, standpoint. And I actually prepared a ve very short deck in terms of our insights, our notes based on our startup journey, and situate and couch that within the context of a challenging sector. Right? I think everybody agrees that. Um, we're actually situated in a sector that's encountering a lot of challenges beset by certain legacy systems and realities. And perhaps answer the question from our end, how did we leverage technology for good to be able to at least tackle some of those systemic um, problems in, in the agri-fishery sector? So as what Bettina mentioned, I actually hailed from, <clears throat> from Miami and we're actually here to empower smallholder farmers and fisher folks through a digital value chain. And if we come to think about it, if you trace back our story in our genesis when we were starting out in 2019, right? Um, when we formally incorporated the company late of 2019, we were having these conversations on the ground, boots on the ground with smallholder farmers coming from, from Western Batangas in Southern Luzon. And one of the farmers we were speaking with is actually uh, a member of the Malarohatan Family Farm Association. It's uh, a cooperative of about 60 members coming from Lian Batangas, and his name was Ka Felix. And perhaps just to humanize the conversation a bit, we, when we were having that conversation, one of the nagging challenges of a farmer that he shared with us was that even if he's harvesting low land or what we call the pinakbet vegetables, he would recurrently encounter two specific challenges. Number one, finding customers. Number two, finding customers that would purchase his fresh produce and harvest at fair prices. And I think when we were researching beyond that cooperative, we actually encountered and asked ourselves the question, is this a broader reality in the Philippines? Is it just a microcosm of a systemic phenomenon in in the Philippine agri-fishery sector. And it really was when we were starting to engage a lot of these cooperatives across the country, across the regions, we were seeing the same recurring realities in the sector. <clears throat> but when we launched uh, the company in late of 2019, we started working with a lot of these organized farmers and fisher folks. As what Prof. Adriana mentioned, when we talk about smallholder, that's about less than one hectare of land. And to be able to reach economies of scale, you have to be able to advocate clustering and them working together and organizing themselves. And so ever since we started, we started sparking this, this tech revolution in the Philippine agri-food value chain, of course, with the support of different stakeholders and partners. From what literally started from a small apartment garage um, in the middle is a picture of my co-founder and chief farmer, I believe is in the audience right now, Ochi San Juan, as well as the rest of, of my co-founders. 
from what literally start from a small apartment garage in 2019, you started moving truckloads and truckloads of fresh produce now and harvest and catch coming from different regions across the country, from as far as Ilocos Norte, all the way down to Calabarzon, even from as far as the Fisher Folks Associations we work with in uh, Zambales region facing the West Philippine Sea. We started engaging a lot of these farmers and started scaling and providing that reliable and dependable output market linkage. In the words of Prof. Adriano, undertaking that holistic value chain approach and not just focus on production, but perhaps more importantly, more practically from the standpoint of a farmer, provide that stable market for them downstream and distribute it to the market. We were fusing our boots on the ground, social capital and a local know-how by engaging a lot of these farmers, fisher folks across different regions in the country. And even at the time of crisis, when a lot of our oil growers and farmers were crying for help, giving us distress calls and actually, you know, reaching out to us and saying, help us out. Um, we want to be able, it's harvest season. We want to be able to move this down to the market. We just don't know how. And so <clears throat> that really galvanized the belief that we are only as strong as, as our ecosystem partners in terms of this holistic value chain approach. And so these are some of the partners we currently work with, you know, in, in terms of modern trade, we've done a collaboration with the likes of Shell, We've done, we're doing a partnership uh, with the likes of Walter Mart and our key Robinsons, uh, you know, group partners was Walter Mart and expanding, especially within the modern trade channel, working with some of the biggest supermarket chains in the country, providing that stable institutional recurring demand for the outputs and the harvest of our farmers, especially across five regions in Luzon. <clears throat> Eventually, we started covering even our smallholder fisher folks, um, recognizing that the Philippines has one of the longest discontinuous coastlines in the world with a sizable sector of fisher folks, artisanal fish, you know, fisher folks, and at the same time, those involved in municipal fisheries 15 kilometers from, from the coastline and actually providing them that stable market. <clears throat> and I guess from that, you know, I, I wanted to share these couple of insights and maybe just to take off a bit from, uh, from what Prof. Adriano actually mentioned earlier and, and use that as a springboard. I want to answer these three core questions. As an impact-driven agri-fishery startup for Mayani, in our quest for breaking what we call the grass ceiling, I want to answer the following questions. One, how did we leverage technology for good? Uh, because that's topic assigned to me. Second, what lessons did we learn? And third, are there tech imperatives that we can take to drive more positive impact in a sector that is otherwise devoid of a lot of these innovations? <clears throat> the first insight I want to drive is really that whenever we hear about technological innovations in, in the sector, right, um, it would always harp on the equalizing power of, of technology. And I would say that the litmus test of technology's equalizing power is really inclusive access with income. And I would say the operative phrase there would be inclusive access with income. I remember when I was attending one of those uh, one of those talks um, organized by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They said farmers farm because they want to be able to turn their crops into cash. It's that practical reality, right? Like they wake up one day, they harvest, and in our conversations with a lot of these cooperatives, as we speak today, right? Like like in his MBC briefing farmers we would always receive calls coming from farmers and say sir we have a huge harvest what do we do with this right and in the recent headlines just this week we've seen farmers with large metric tons of tomatoes actually just dumping it and throwing it away so i would say when we use technology and we when we build innovations for the sector and we these with these stakeholders it's always about how do we enable these farmers and these fisher folks to be onboarded into our business, but at the same time, enable them to have that recurring income and predictable income, you know, just because they're linked with us. And I guess, you know, this is, this is the real challenge when it comes to the downstream output market linkage play, providing not just that one and done approach um, when it comes to purchasing harvest from our farmers, but being there with them season after season.
right? Um, and not just for one crop, but for as many SKUs and crops as possible. The second thing that we would say is that we need to be able to humanize problem solving and make it the centerpiece of our innovation. I think from our perspective, at least from a technological standpoint, a lot of the product managers or maybe like the CTOs, software engineers, right, who actually seek and envision a lot of technological disruption in the sector, um, a lot of them really have to take into account the nuances of the Philippine agri-fishery sector. Like in our case, when we develop a lot of our proprietary tools that we're using so we can operate efficiently in a very agile manner, in a very data-driven manner, in a sector that is devoid of a lot of data, um, to be able to operate in a very transparent way in terms of the supply chain, we had to take into account a lot of those grassroots insights, literally harvest feedback coming from the farmers and actually say, these are the real problems you're encountering. This is how we're solving it. And this is how we're building the technological solution around it. In our case, in terms of output market linkage, some of the things we were considering would always be letter A, seasonality. Number two, the specialization of certain cooperatives when it comes to specific crops. Like we have a cooperative that would specialize when it comes to like onions. We have a cooperative that would specialize when it comes to pinakbet or lowland vegetables. We have a cooperative that would just specialize in root crops like ube, for instance, coming from our tribal farmers. So we had to take that into account when we were building the technological product and actually building, broadly speaking, the entire business. <clears throat> Third is that without traction coupled with sale, there is no impact. A lot of our, you know, especially in, in, in the private sector, right? Um, when you take a look at a lot of the things happening right now from an ESG lens, a lot of people we'd often hear impact, impact, impact. But for us, our impact is a byproduct of our robust commercial traction. Um, we're starting off with output market linkage, recognizing again that holistic value chain approach, which is an imperative in the Philippine agri, you know, agricultural sector. But at the same time, we recognize that to be able to really boost rural incomes when it comes to these farmers, we need to be able to play that part when it comes to providing that fair and sustainable pathways to the market as a player. right? And, and that's when we could see that their incomes are actually increased. That's where we see better participation, for instance, of women in, in the agri-fisheries value chain. That's where we see a lot of measurable and tangible change coming at the grassroots level. And lastly, you know, because Prof. Adriano also touched on some of the byproduct implica uh, byproducts of, of the challenges of the sector and some of those ramifications, right, of these challenges, especially when it comes to adjacent concerns such, such as malnutrition, stunted growth, food security, my insight and the insight I want to drive in here, which is the last point, is for technological startups like us and tech companies, right, to actually seek to change and append the sector, we're really harnessing technology here as the rallying and the convergence point for ecosystem building. And by ecosystem building, I'm saying it becomes that convergence point where in a lot of the different like-minded stakeholders can actually rally together and give back to causes and at least develop solutions for concerns that matter to them. And I guess, you know, being in this platform with MBC, where you have a lot of like private sector players, a lot of different stakeholders, this is very beneficial. I'd like to sort of touch on this because for issues such as hunger, for instance, for issues such as malnourishment, undernutrition, we have work with some of these different, even civil society organizations like Caritas Manila, Save the Children, um, for the, or Aboitis Foundation for their end hunger campaigns, and really utilize technology as a force for good to be able to help out farmers, particularly in providing that stable and sustainable access to market, but at the same time tackle those adjacent concerns such as malnourishment and you know uh, undernutrition and hunger, especially among indigent communities. And I've and I'm saying that it's possible. These are the things that you otherwise wouldn't have, would have had, had the capacity to be able to do right had it not been for technology. And we're really indexing on this. And so we, we, we would like to invite, right? Like the, the entire ecosystem, especially the private sector to be able to help us out, right? In solving and tackling these problems 
one by one. So those are the four core insights I'd like to share and drive uh, during this economic briefing from couch within the context of Mayani's journey and you know um, gleaning insights from, from that kind of a journey. So if you want to help, if you want to collaborate, if you want to pitch into that kind of an effort and that revolution, tech enabled revolution that we're doing to be able to empower and uplift the lives of smaller farmers and fisher folks in the Philippines, drop us a note. My email is here and I'll be happy to take on those questions during Q&A. All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adriano and JT, for the very insightful uh, talks that you gave on the agriculture sector. Um, and I'd like to encourage everyone to you know, ask questions, post your comments. Uh, we are now opening the floor to questions from the audience. If you have any questions, please raise your hand or enter your questions into the chat box. Um, okay. Um, so we have uh, one question here in the chat box. Actually, we have a couple. Um, one from Chris Lee. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Prof. Adriano. How do you reconcile your points on one, building forward linkages, and two, liberalization? Wouldn't cheap importation discourage forward linkages as local food companies would rather import than demand from and develop the local value chain? So I guess it's addressed to Dr. Adriano. Yes. So basically, in the short term, if you do trade liberalization, there will be a, a bias toward the cheaper imported goods, right? In the short term. But basically, what, what we want to happen in the midterm or long term, that our agriculture producers, local agriculture producers, will be as competitive or more competitive than the imports. Than the than the other countries, so that's the basically that's the gist. We want more foreign competition to ensure that our our farmers will also compete with them. So basically, they don't have a choice. But again, there is this big role of the government to ensure the development of the agriculture sector, right? Not just the production, but the whole value chain. Again, it's important. To look at it as a whole value chain rather than just one segment of the value chain. All right. So in the short term, definitely there will be bias towards using more of the imported uh, cheaper commodities. But hopefully in the midterm to long term, basically the goal is that our local producers will just be as competitive or more competitive than the foreign countries. Thank you. All right. Um, next, uh, I think there is addressed to both uh, Prof. Adriana and JT. My question is, would con my question would consider the consequences of climate change on agriculture productivity, and the mentioned adapt adaptation mechanisms of AMIA. Can we already assess um, to what extent climate change? already affects productivity of the agriculture sector, especially considering rice harvesting. How can technology assist in facing these challenges? From Alexander Burgos. All right, I'll just give you the statistics, statistics first. So estimated annual damages because of climate change in the Philippines is around 25 billion pesos for agriculture only, agriculture alone. So annually, it's around 25 billion. So it's a significant impact. And the, and if you take a look at uh, news clips, there are times we have shortages in some commodities because a typhoon hit us, particularly rice during their harvest season in North Luzon. If a typhoon hits the North Luzon during their harvest season, we're already in panic mode, even the government, because they know we will have rice shortages and that's really bad for the politicians. So yes, it has a big impact and there are many models that shows that climate change will have a significant impact, not just not just internationally, but also in the Philippines. In terms of technology, there are many. Uh, like for instance, for the, what you call it, crop insurance. Crop insurance is very important for climate uh, mitigation or resiliency. And you can employ a lot of new technologies for crop insurance. Unfortunately, we're still, our PCIC, our crop insurance system, are, are, are still basically in the, it's not 
taking advantages of these technologies. So those are just examples. Maybe JT can add more in terms of technologies. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Prof. Adriano. We're in, you know, you have a there's definitely a strong nexus now between the agri fishery sector and climate change. And if you were able to quantify its impact, that's how huge it is. From a technological standpoint, we have seen that. The most practical use of technology in terms of our smaller farmers and fisher folks would always be would always be on hazard mapping, right? Um, normally, the modalities would go around kidlat kulog baha, um, and the wave height, especially for fisher folks. So, mm. those are the things that are very practical to them. And you know, we're actually working closely with another uh, technological startup. They're called Comunidad, and they're all about leveraging climate intelligence to be able to impact positively the lives of smaller farmers, especially for those particular events wherein they would need to be able to be, you know, to, to append their climate smart DNA as, as smaller farmers. So, you know, giving that early warning um, when it comes to, for instance, wave height during the Southwest monsoon season or uh, Habagat, um, as well as those instances were in there are certain areas or agricultural lands that are more prone to kidlat, hulog, or baha. I think those are, from a very practical standpoint, right? Being able to inform them, warn them right away, give them a heads up of these particular weather conditions could really spell the difference between them sustaining their livelihood and them, you know, losing that livelihood. So I think from a tech standpoint, that's that's kind of like one of those very practical applications. Can I add just more? Sure. So another example that is very needed to combat climate change is irrigation. All right. The access to irrigation, particularly to mga ano yung nagfo farm ng crops. Now the problem with our irrigation is that seventy to eighty percent of the budget of the National Irrigation Administration goes to rice irrigation. So, for instance, for sugar alone, only I think 20% of the sugar farm is irrigated. And irrigation is very important for sugar. So, you have to make sure that irrigation is accessible not just to rice farmers, but to everyone else. Another example, I think JT already mentioned this, is that there should be a plan. So, we already know climate change is definitely here. It will not go away. It's already a... We cannot basically... Uh, run away from the effects of climate change. Now, there needs to be a plan that given the changes in climates per region or per area, what is the most efficient or most effective crop to be planted in that area? Like for instance, Mindanao, there will be more rains because of climate change. So there will be a changes in the crops that is most productive in the type of climate. So there needs to be that kind of planning. All right, uh, we'll move on to, we thank you for that, uh, JT and Dr. Adriano. We'll move on to, we'll try to get through all these questions as much as possible. There's a lot of them on the chat box. Uh, next would be uh, from Sheldine Talavera uh, to Mr. Adriano. How did the DA respond in regards to your recommendations? <laughs> okay, just to clarify, I'm not part of the DA anymore. <laughs> That's already the answer. Yeah. Um, from Edne Becerra, at present, where is the government, specifically the DA, in terms of bridging the logistical gap uh, sorry, b between farmers, producers, buyers, resellers, and consumers? Um, would anybody like to chime in on that? I think uh, both would have experience in dealing with the logistical gaps of trying to move around the goods from our farmers. I think in our experience, uh, Bettina, we've worked closely with the different uh, regional offices of DA. Uh, I, re I could clearly recall that we were actually able to tap um, their AMAD um, unit uh, under DA to be able to help us out when it comes to trucking, especially for our community of farmers coming from, I would say, challenging topography. Uh, you know, let's say Aita farmers, uh, let's say our tribal farmers from the mountains. Um, and we work very closely with them. And I, I guess it's it's a good collaboration that we want to be able to build on. I think the more 
resources that they'll be able to mobilize towards helping bridge that logistical gap right between farmers and consumers is something that we would welcome as as a tech startup as a supply chain player all right uh move on to the next question uh what is the so from J- jason what is the solution to address oversupply in highly productive provinces and distribute the areas in need uh that's really a value chain problem basically so um it's part it's probably the role of the government to ensure that if there is oversupply in one area it can be brought to the other areas wherein there is insufficient supply all right that is not the the fault of the farmers if there is oversupply that's just i, I just want to put that out so how do we uh so, so provide a solution basically we already know the statistics we know the harvest season of some commodities you can use psa data and you can compare it to the supply of the local supply of that area versus the local demand so you can basically come up with the prediction will there be an oversupply in this area and, and if the answer is yes then we need to come up with a plan how do we bring this oversupplied commodities to other region where there is there is insufficient supply all right that is not the job of the farmer anymore that's the job of the private sector and the government uh jtr would you like to chime in on and, that okay sorry, sorry one more and i think e-commerce can be very helpful with this kind of problem and there are already several studies studying yung e-commerce and versus the basically the shaders and e-commerce will help this will help with this problem a lot basically the farmers will be already connected to the end consumers yes definitely um i will combine two questions na for which are both addressed to jt <laughs> um first from chris lee from the board of innovation what is the chief value proposition you provide local buyers like walter mart and robinsons is it a cheaper product versus imports if not Uh, Mayani crops, sorry. Um, if not, uh, Mayani crops are more expensive. How do you generate demand from these buyers at scale? Uh, and another one uh, from Paul Campued. Um, any farmer co-ops in the Tanay area, Highland Tanay barangays like Santa Ines, Kuy- Kuyambay, Kayabu, and Tinukan? Yeah, oh, well, Paul is obviously from the community. I'd like to answer kind of like that that one first. Uh, yes, Paul, we actually work with, uh, we actually source our dragon fruit and rambutan from the upland uh, tonight, and we already work with, uh, we're firming up a partnership with Santa Ines Farmers. Um, our chief farmer, Ochi Sanwan, is also in the audience. So, you know, um, if we could set up a meeting with you separately and onboard you in, in Miami, they'll be great. Uh, more than happy to help out our highland farmers coming from uh, Tanay. On the second question regarding our value proposition or our central value proposition for institutional buyers, right? Like the partners we already work with, like Walmart or Robinsons. I think number one is from, from a strategic level, you need to be able to have that meeting of the minds when it comes to that mission convergence, right? Are we in to be able to append jointly the sector? Are we here to be able to, you know, are we here jointly boosting um, output market linkage for the sector? And I guess if you already have that as a baseline agreement with a lot of these institutional partners, you can already thresh out a lot of those tactical details from there. But even from a supply chain standpoint, it's all about building that sustainable and resilient supply chain for them. Our supply chain, at least for the last couple of months, has been prone to a lot of external shocks, right? Um, and, and globally, we've seen that because of all these movements, we had certain supply crunches, i.e. garlic, i.e. onions. And I guess our proposition for these institutional buyers is we can make you resilient and still be able to give your fair share of contribution to the sector through us. And, and that's how we are able to do it. Um, in terms of how do we you know, generate demand at scale while at the same time utilizing and I would say tackling those problems of gluts uh, or oversupply. It's all about leveraging data, right? Like how do we leverage 
demand data coming from the markets who are we are able to dovetail production such that there's no disjoint and there's no mismatch between supply and demand. But number two, take a more granular look and a nuanced look at production of certain cooperatives and see and find ways. There are different channels out there wherein you are still able to generate offtake coming from the market. I'll give you a concrete example. One of the categories we've been heavily promoting in Miami is called imperfect crops. These are the crops that are cosmetically imperfect and are otherwise rejected by large institutional buyers because they're crooked carrots, they're very small potatoes, there's very small tomatoes, or you know they're not straight cucumbers. But that doesn't mean that there's no offtake and that those crops are actually automatically going to go towards landfills and just going to become you know, a, a food waste uh, number. We've been able to directly market it to consumers. And at the same time, we're also educating now our institutional buyers, i.e. food processors, who will just powderize it anyway, or who will make tomato sauce out of very small tomatoes, and therefore be able to tackle that problem of oversupply. Right, uh, because not everything is really going to go towards modern trade. Not everything is going to pass through the standards and parameters of supermarket chains like Walter Mart or Robinsons, which we already work with. All right. Um, for the next question from Don Sankrabanyes, how can we compete with other Southeast Asian countries, which can, uh, which can three rice harvests have three rice harvests a year, uh, due to advantage of having the Mekong River? Whereas the Philippines is only limited to two. Actually, we've I've discussed this uh, with uh, Jose Cleo Sebastian, if you know him, uh, before about this three, uh, but three rice harvest, and he mentioned several disadvantages. So Jose Cleo Sebastian was the director of uh, Phil Rice before, right? So he knows rice production and rice harvest, and he mentioned we cannot do. There are a lot of disadvantages with three rice harvest in the Philippines. Now, what we can do is to increase our productivity, our farm productivity of rice. Unfortunately, if you take a look at data, our farm productivity compared to Vietnam is very low, relatively very low compared to Vietnam. So the problem here is that one, uh, a big chunk of our rice farmers are relatively small. Uh, marami, there are many who are considered subsistence farmers, meaning less than one hectare. And this less than one hectare farmers usually do not actually sell their rice to consumers and mostly used for own consumption. So there are many ways to increase productivity. Maybe one is farm clustering. And if you're able to farm cluster, you can use machines and technology to improve productivity. So I'm not, again, I'm not yet sure with the three rice harvest season, but um, according to you, Cleo Sebastian, uh, there are many uh, disadvantages for the three rice harvest. And uh, the way we can compete is by increasing our farm productivity on rice. Mm -hmm. um, I'll skip over some questions from those who've already um, asked. Uh, there's one question, however, addressed to Mayani from Dwight Danasco. Uh, for Mayani, how do you differ from existing e-commerce platforms um, such as Lazada Fresh and Kadiwa Ani at Kita program of the DA? Yeah, well, number one, I think uh, maybe just to draw a line there, Lazada is more like a private sector. Kadiwa Ani at Kita is more like a oh, DA yeah. public sector yeah. uh, initiative, right? Um, for one, uh, well, Lazada is definitely like a big, big player, and it's one of the leading marketplace players in in Southeast Asia. I think they're more of a marketplace business model um, rather than a supply chain model. We're in uh, that's 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 our model. We provide that bridge downstream, post harvest, post catch, for our uh, farmers and cooperatives, as opposed to Lazada, we're in. They have the you know they advocate uh, merchants actually you know, directly connecting with, with the consumers. For us, we're taking a very nuanced approach. We're in our farmers downstream actually need much more than just connection to buyers. They actually need a lot of things such as logistics, a lot of things such as crop grading, a lot of things such as regular offtake. 
Um, so it's a, we're more a supply chain model. Is that it's more like a marketplace model? Kadiwa Ani at Kita program from the DA is a program we're actually dovetailing with. Uh, we work closely with a lot of uh, the Ahmad the Ahmad unit of the Department of Agriculture, and I can tell you that uh, this is a long-standing program already of the DA. Um, I guess the main differentiator is really the utilization of technology. Um, uh, and the extent of the usage of that technology from our end, we utilize uh, technology to be able to do forecasting, uh, to be able to if, you know, efficiently um, operate that fresh supply chain on behalf of our farmers and on behalf of our institutional buyers and really bridging that recurring institutional demand with fragmented supply. Kadiwa uh, at Kita is more like a they utilize trucks. Uh, they put up Kadiwa stores, right? Um, I, I guess that's more of their model. And we're actually collaborating, working closely with them. All right. Uh, one from Jude Arsena. Another question. Uh, modernization was one of the promises of the rice tarification law. However, more than four years into RTL's effectivity, we are still lagging in local rice production. Can agri-liberalization really be the answer? Yes, uh, even data will show you that it is yes. So number one, we already did a study. Not really. Yeah, we we had we we already did a study on the effects of RTL midterm. It's a three year um, three year study of the effects of RTL, and we showed there that rice productivity actually went up during those first three years. And then if you can if you take a look on prices of rice, the contribution of rice due after the RTL was negative. It's only last year, 2022, when prices of when the contribution of rice to inflation is positive. All right. So again, it was effective. It increased productivity. Uh, I can share you a book. We published a book on the effect of RTL for the first three years. Price productivity definitely increased. Number two, uh, prices. Uh, the contribution of rice to inflation actually became negative. Before it was the number one contributor of food inflation. Now after RTL, it's negative. It's not even there in the radar. All right. Um, and I guess can I just if... answer one of the question? Are there any penalties with the disbursement rate of only sixty five percent? Unfortunately, no. Walang <laughs> walang penalties. All right. Um, so. I, I get you know we've we've had a very fruitful discussion. Um, I'd also like to ask uh, to raise uh, a question uh, to both of you, I guess, on MBC's end. Um, for a you know a business association like us, where you know you have a lot of uh, you know different private, we're comprised of various private sector players, some involved in agriculture, some not. Um, however, a lot of them are really interested in helping out the sector. Um, so I guess from JT and. Uh, Dr. Adriano, um, how do you think uh, can the private sector or um, a group like MBC actually be able to help um, in the many glaring issues that we discussed today in agriculture? Um, what would be an effective way uh, the private sector can also chime in? Um, you know, we've already discussed how the government can help, um, but I guess on a wider scale, how can the normal uh, company or a business association who, you know, out of you know, just they just want to help out the farmers. They want to help out this, you know, all these issues on oversupply that has been happening. Uh, what do you think would be the best way for us to be able to do that? Um, yeah, I think uh, before we've already done like uh, some sort of you know connecting, you know, some of some of the farmer groups to. Um, you know, give their goods to you know the employee. Then the companies buy the goods and then they distribute it to employees for for like Christmas or something like that. But that you know didn't seem to be very uh, sustainable at some point. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think from from our end, uh, Bettina, because we already work with uh, kind of like recognizable brands already in conglomerates in in the country. Um, what I would really be my call out here would be to utilize MPC as, as a platform to be able to forge those meaningful relationships, um, especially with, with players like us, possibly work closely with those other large conglomerates and see how we can integrate our community farmers into your value chain, right? Um, if your conglomerate is actually has an agri-food business and an agri-business subsidiary, a food processing arm, 
Um, if if you are involved in any way to the in the Hareka sector or modern trade, if you have a huge foundation, um, for instance, why don't we leverage an index on your social procurement uh, methods, right? And be able to leverage also your brand value to be able to let's say do co-marketing campaigns to be able to move excess harvest coming from our farmers which is like a recurring and a relevant daily talk of the town problem right now um and at the same time leverage your reach and your size to be able to integrate with our value chain and see how we could also from our end make it more resilient make it more reliable make it more sustainable and enable you to uphold for instance your sustainability agenda right so i think that's that's a concrete way so feel free to reach out to us, right? Like, please, this is uh, more than happy to explore synergies and, and firm up areas of collaboration, especially with MBC and your MBC, e MBC ecosystem. All right, uh, Dr. Eliana, would you like to chime in on that? Sorry, I was answering questions in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't able to listen to some of the questions, sorry. Uh, no, uh, just a question on how uh, can the private sector help out also in the many glaring issues of agriculture? Uh, I think the involvement of the private sector in the agriculture is basically because of more because of overregulation of the government and because of the relatively fragmented size of the lands in agriculture. So I guess uh, there are some, uh, what you call it, there are some, uh, merong, I think there are some ways for the private sector to help, like for instance, uh, agriculture insurance. I think th there's there are a few private sector who help in agriculture insurance. But the, the real glaring problem here is that private investment in the agriculture is very low. And I think we need to fix some government problems first, like the land fragmentation side and also uh, and others before the private sector can actually participate freely or more on agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. And okay. actually, if you take a, a look at the agri-agra law, it hasn't been... Uh, it hasn't been working, the Agri-Agri law, wherein a portion of the loans should be available to agriculture sector. It's not working at all because there's not. it's very hard for the private sector to actually um, invest in the agriculture sector because of the land fragmentation and other overregulation of the government. Mm -hmm. So for okay. now, I think the private sector can help with the midstream, midstream, uh, yung logistics, uh, cold chains, cold chain infrastructure, and then maybe agriculture insurance if it will be possible in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, this was a very um, fun intended, fruitful <laughs> conversation uh, on the various issues surrounding agriculture. Uh, which is all the more relevant uh, given the, you know, how we are all definitely feeling inflation. I think you can see it, uh, all these social media memes on the, on how, you know, onions are now equivalent to gold and how it's an expensive, um, highly priced commodity. So we hope that uh, this discussion was very fruitful <laughs> to all of you. And I hope that um, you, um, it's been uh, quite insightful and you can contact uh, JT and Dr. Adriano. Uh, we will also be posting, I mean, we'll be sending the slides to those who have requested them. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, you know, the questions. It was, um, lo lots of questions came in, which made a very fruitful Q&A. Uh, we invite your comments and feedback on today's event. Uh, please scan the QR code on your screens, or you may also click the link provided in the chat box. And uh, please note that we might use your comments in some of our publications. Uh, for social media, please feel free to follow us on Facebook uh, at Makati Business Club at MBC Forum on Twitter and Makati Business Club on LinkedIn. Uh, I would also like to take this uh, moment to invite you to visit MBC's economic dashboard. The economy dashboard provides executives and policymakers handy access to economic data on the Philippines and its neighbors. 
And we'd also like to do a little plug. Uh, we'd like to invite you to our next event, um, just the second of the face-to-face -face with Cabinet Secretary series. You will be featuring Neda Secretary Arsenio Balisacan on February 23. You may visit our website, mbc.com.ph for more details. And once again, thank you so much to Dr. Adriano and to JT for sharing your experiences, your insights, and your analysis. And to our wonderful event sponsor, Mon Denisen, and to all our participants today, I hope you found this discussion valuable and useful. And we look forward to seeing you and working with you again on any future activities. Thank you so much.